Section seventy six of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section seventy six. W. P. Madden. I was born in Galway, Ireland, on the fourteenth of March, eighteen forty four. Enlisted at Springfield, Ohio, on the ninth of October, eighteen sixty one, in Company I, forty fourth Ohio Volunteer Infantry and 8th Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Was captured at Lynchburg on the 18th of June, 1864, and confined in Andersonville Prison. On the morning of the 27th of April, 1865, at about 2 o'clock, I was asleep dreaming of home and loved ones, of whom I had not heard a word for about ten long months that I had spent in Andersonville Prison. Suddenly I was awakened by an upheaval and crashing of timbers. I attempted to arise from my recumbent position, and as I threw up my hands to explore my surroundings I got them severely burned, and was horrified to find that my efforts to extricate myself were fruitless and the heat was stifling. I could not tell where I was, but could hear the groans of the wounded and the shrieks of the women mingling with the crackling noise of the flames and the hissing of the white steam that enveloped the boat for a time. All of this took place in a few moments, but those few moments were an eternity to me. No tongue can tell, and pen is powerless to portray the agony of those moments. Thoughts went rushing through my brain with lightning rapidity. I thought of all I had suffered and endured for ten months, and of the joys anticipated at home. And now, so near the goal, must I give up the ghost? Not without a struggle. The rebels had failed to kill me in battle, or to starve me to death in prison. I wrapped my blanket about me in order to protect myself from further violence from my hot environments. I called in the name of my divine master for someone to remove whatever hindered my escape, and may God bless whoever he may be that removed the obstruction, I know him not. I crawled out as black and begrimed as a coal digger. I then discovered that I had been under a piece of boiler iron, about a half of a circle, both ends being blocked with timbers and debris thrown hither and thither by the force of the explosion. I had a much esteemed friend by the name of George Menninger, a Piat Zouave. His home was in Cincinnati, Ohio. He shared my blanket, but what became of him I have not been able to learn. Nor is it to be wondered at in the confusion that followed the explosion. This was a time when strong men, who never faltered before the galling fire of the enemy's front, were powerless wringing their hands and rending the air with their piteous cries. No one now gave the orders, each being left to battle for himself. The deck was broken in two, presenting a fiery chasm between, like Dante's Inferno. Burning human forms could be seen below until the river was obscured by the flames, which soon communicated with the upper deck. Every available thing that would float was hastily gathered up and with precious freight went overboard, but often only to be submerged by the addition of others and rise again on some distant wave, far away and unoccupied, to be again possessed by another struggler and borne safely with the current until rescued by friendly hands. Almost invariably the means of escape was overburdened, and it was often the case that parties were drowned, that others might use their floats to a practical advantage. No doubt many a good swimmer lost his life by being made powerless by the icy waters of the northwest with which the Mississippi River is flushed at that time of the year. All this time I was endeavoring to keep from being pushed into the river by my wild and distracted comrades who were rushing to and fro. In order to do this, I had to lie down, often at the risk of being trampled upon. I remained on the boat as long as the heat would permit, seeing that it would be fatal to launch myself among the floating sea of perishing humanity, grasping at everything within reach, 
and often carrying to the bottom those that would have otherwise escaped. I was fortunate in being a very good swimmer, and with confidence in my ability to reach shore I waited until the coast was clear. I then made a running jump from the fore and upper deck, but before reaching the water I lost my balance and fell face downward, knocking the breath out of me and producing an inguinal hernia, which I now carry, much to my discomfort. This hurt caused me to swallow at the time a large quantity of water, causing strangulation, so that it was with the greatest difficulty that I again reached the surface. After I got my breath, I swam downstream in a diagonal direction for the east bank, but for some unknown reason I changed my mind and turned for the west side. I now began to experience a peculiarly numb sensation commencing in my great toes and extending upwards. Being thoroughly awake to the meaning of all this, I bestirred myself to the most vigorous and active kicking that I ever did in my life. Now and then I would pinch my limbs, but could not make them believe that it was I, and yet as long as they kept kicking I felt safe. They had often served me, and when a boy, they had saved me many a whipping, and they did not fail me on this occasion. Somewhere between the boat and the shore I overtook three soldiers, of whom I recognized one, a sergeant of an Illinois regiment, a fine specimen of a man in every particular, and I always admired him. He, with the other two, was trying to keep above the water with the aid of a very trifling bit of board. One of the party was about exhausted. I swam to them, put my hands on the board, and had this man put his arm on my shoulder and his other on the sergeant, and we pushed on, but it was soon evident that our load was going to overtax our strength. With no evidence at hand of the distance yet to overcome, and as he was already past helping himself, true to the first law of nature, I released myself, and our friend went down to be seen no more. Could I have perceived the short distance to the shore, I would have saved his life, but so dark was it that the first intimation that I had of a shore was when I struck my head against a lot of drift, upon which I dragged myself, at the same time shouting back to those I had parted with my deliverance and encouraging them to persevere, and soon I had the pleasure of helping them to a place of safety. I then removed my pants and shirt, wrung the water out of them, and put them on again, then went at vigorous walking, as did also my friend from Illinois, but the other we had to pull along between us until a better circulation was obtained for him after which we got along very well considering our condition. About seven or eight o'clock in the morning we were taken on board the steamer Bostonia and taken to Memphis. Here I want to digress a little to speak a word of praise in behalf of the mate who, with his pilot, was blown into the river. It was he, with the aid of a skiff, conveyed to us to the boat, and although wet and chilled, he did not cease his efforts in caring for others as long as there were any found needing assistance. Even on the boat where hot coffee and fire was accessible, he looked not for his own comfort until all others were first served. This self-sacrificing and unselfish devotion to the wants of others is seldom found, and I mention this as an expression of my admiration for his conduct on that occasion. Thanks to General Washburn, in a few days we left Memphis for Camp Chase, Ohio, to be mustered out of service, in obedience to telegraphic orders from the War Department. And now, glorious transition! Away from the late scenes of horror, caressed and adulated by those who long ago gave me up for dead, and providential blessings through those years that have passed, have done much to compensate for what I have suffered but oh how many a sad and desolate home who can tell of that anguish in those hearts which fondly waited for the coming of the dear one let us reverently treasure up in our hearts the memory of the brave dead of the sultana 
and let our association devote one day of its sittings in some appropriate way to commemorate their deeds of virtue. I am engaged in the practice of medicine at Xenia, Ohio. End of section 76「Section 77 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 77. Jotham W. Mays. I was born in Huron County, Ohio, November 15, 1842, and enlisted in the service of the United States at New Boston, Michigan, June 15, 1861, in Company B, 47th Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Served with my regiment in all its campaigns, till on the twenty-second day of July, 1864, when I was captured in front of Atlanta, Georgia, and taken to Andersonville. I remained there until Sherman began his famous march to the sea, when I, with others, was removed to Millen, thence to Savannah, from there to Blackshear Station, thence to Thomasville, and at last marched sixty miles across the country and put on board the cars at Albany, and taken to Andersonville again, entering that terrible prison on Christmas Eve, 1864. I remained here until about the 17th day of March, 1865, when 500 of us were taken out and sent to Jackson, Mississippi, and from there marched to the Big Black River, where we were received by our own men and given a ration of hard tack and coffee with a good suit of new clothes a blanket and a tent we remained at big black river until exchanged and put on board the sultana myself and two comrades bunked together just back of the left wheelhouse on the middle deck the first sensation i experienced was that of falling down through space as probably many of you have felt when you had an attack of nightmare i soon realized that it was no nightmare for we were immersed in the icy water of the river about three by ten feet of the portion of the deck upon which we were sleeping having been blown with its occupants into the river the shock of the deck striking the water threw us all off from it but we soon found it again and others came to us until that small piece of deck saved ten lives the way we managed was to keep evenly divided around the edge and just float along i shall never forget the terrible scene that i beheld as i glanced back at the boat and realized what had occurred the smokestacks of the sultana were lying crisscross crushing whoever they struck the boat was on fire, and the flames were driving the men into the water by the hundred, and no matter how good a swimmer a man might be, if he got into one of those crowds, his doom was sealed, and he would go down with the clutching mass. As we came in sight of the coal bins opposite Memphis, we attempted to make them, but the current carried us away so that we could not neither could we reach the memphis shore nor make the people on either bank hear us we floated some three or four miles below memphis before we were picked up and were then found by a quartermaster's yawl and when taken in were so thoroughly chilled that we could not help ourselves as we were making for the shore at fort pickering the troops mistook us for guerrillas from the arkansas side of the river trying to capture the fort and fired two volleys on us before they found out their mistake fortunately no one was hurt we were taken to memphis and soon sent to columbus ohio thence to jackson michigan and soon discharged my present post office address is new boston michigan end of section seventy seven Section 78 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 78. Jerry Mahoney. I was born in Ireland, December 23, 1842, 
and enlisted in the service of the United States September 23, 1861, at Detroit, Michigan, in Company I, 2nd Regiment, Michigan Cavalry. Was captured at Florence, Alabama, November 9, 1864, and was confined in the Meridian and Cahaba, Alabama prisons. My capture was as follows. When Sherman marched to the sea, he sent Stanley to reinforce him but Hood was nearer to Nashville than Stanley. Hood had Lee, Stewart, and Cheatham. Lee crossed the Tennessee River at Florence, Alabama. Stewart and Cheatham were still on the south side. I was sent for by General Croxton, who asked me if I would go at night and cut the pontoon bridge at Florence, Alabama. I could go alone or take some comrade with me. He said there was nothing I could ask the government for, but that I could have it. I could have a commission, a furlough, or anything else, and he would open communication with the Rebs at daylight and exchange us, if it took one hundred for one. I started with five others. We got some citizens' coats, and putting them on, arrived at the bridge at two o'clock a.m., and, as the Rebs stated in the newspaper the next day, while portions of that army were on each side of the river, a party of bold Federals came down the river in skiffs and succeeded in cutting the bridge in two or three places. Hatchets were found in their possession. It is one of the boldest of Federal raids during the campaign. We got rid of the coats before we were taken prisoners. That night we were kept in a vacant store, and while the guards slept, three of the comrades got away, but they failed to cut the bridge. I drew the attention of the guard at the door by selling my watch that was hid in my bootleg. They, my three comrades, went upstairs and got out of the window. They were missed in three or four hours, and the bloodhounds were sent after them, but they had crossed the river. I had no one to help me get away, so I stayed. I never saw or heard of them after that. I received a seven months furlough and then was paroled when the rest were. Address 3249 LaSalle Street, Chicago, Illinois. End of section 78. Section 79 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 79 Jesse Martin I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, February 19, 1842. I enlisted in the service of the United States at Rona, Indiana, September 5, 1861, in Company D, 35th Indiana Infantry. I was captured at Kennesaw Mountain, Georgia, June 19, 1864, and confined in the following prisons. Andersonville, Savannah, Millen, and Blackshear. I was sleeping in the deck room when the explosion occurred. At first it seemed to me as though someone was on my breast with his knees and choking me with his hands. When I came to, I was down on my knees by a cow as though I had got there to milk her. If the cow had not stopped me, I guess I would have gone on into the wheelhouse, and then I would not have survived to write this. The wheel was still turning and water coming in on me, which helped to bring me to. I soon found out what the matter was, and began to look around to see what chance there was to escape. I started to see if I could find some of my regiment but could not get to where I had left them. I then went aft to see how things were. All was confusion. Some were praying, others crying or swearing, and some jumping overboard. I found one man who seemed to be taking things coolly. I went to him and asked him if he would help me throw things to those in the water to swim on. We went to work throwing over anything we could find that would float except a large plank. This we saved for ourselves. We stayed on the boat until the fire drove us off. We then threw the plank in and jumped in after it, 
but lost it. I never saw the man after that. I started to swim ashore and happened to find a small piece of plank which helped me along. I landed on an island and was picked up by the steamer Pocahontas. Occupation Farming Mount Pleasant, Ohio End of section 79《Section 80 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. — Section 80. Joseph H. Mays. I was born in Park County, Indiana, August 31, 1846. Enlisted in the service of the United States at Waveland, Montgomery County, Indiana, on the 12th of November, 1861, in Company C, 40th Regiment Indiana Volunteers, and was captured at Franklin, Tennessee, November 30, 1864, and confined in the Cahaba Prison in Alabama. I was on the cabin deck of the Sultana when the boiler exploded. One of the smokestacks about six feet from me fell and broke the deck in, and I went through on to the lower deck. I noticed that every man had to take care of himself. I could not swim, so I got four slats one inch thick, three inches wide, and about ten feet long, and took my tent rope and tied them together. Then I was ready. I picked up the slats and jumped into the river and started to paddle my own canoe. I got along finely until a drowning man caught me by my ankle. I kicked him loose and then tried to pull for the shore. Sometimes I would get within fifty yards of the shore, and the current would carry me toward the other side of the river, and then I would try for that side, but it would strike me again, so I just kept floating back and forth across the river. I came across a man from a Michigan regiment. I said, "'Hello, comrade. Advance and give the countersign.' I asked him if he could swim. He said no. Then I asked him what kind of plank he had. He replied, One about two feet wide and ten feet long. We two got together and tried to reach the shore, but the current would carry us back and forth across the river as before, and by this time we were getting cold and somewhat discouraged. The man from Michigan said he would have to let go and drown. I told him that would never do, and urged him to hold on. By this time we were so cold that we stopped trying to get out. We could not move hand or foot, and the Michigan man swore that he could not hold on any longer. I looked down the river and saw the headlight of a boat coming, and encouraged my comrade to hold on by saying it would probably take us in. This was about one hour before daylight. We became unconscious and did not remember when we were picked up. We came to about nine o'clock that day. My present occupation is farming. Post office address, Lebanon, Boone County, Indiana. End of section 80。section 81 of Loss of the Sultana。by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 81. George B. McCord. I was born in Erie County, Ohio, April 8, 1844. My childhood days were spent in Erie and Sandusky counties, Ohio. I attended school in Bellevue, Clyde, and Fremont, Ohio, and after the war in Cornell College, Mount Vernon, Iowa enlisted in the service of the United States at Sandusky County, Ohio, as a private in Company G, 111th Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry, in August 1862, and mustered into service at Camp Toledo by Captain Howard, United States Army. Received the appointment of orderly sergeant, and afterwards promoted to first lieutenant and placed in command of Company F passed through many spirited and exciting battles, 
and experienced many long and fatiguing marches through ohio kentucky tennessee georgia and alabama was in the siege of knoxville and battles in that vicinity atlanta campaign and battles along the line i was captured at cedar bluff alabama in october eighteen sixty four made my escape and was hunted down by bloodhounds and returned to the prison at cahaba alabama from there was sent to andersonville georgia after remaining there about six months was taken to vicksburg mississippi where we were comfortably clothed and properly fed we remained there about thirty days and then boarded the ill-fated steamer sultana everything moved along quietly and pleasantly until we passed memphis tennessee i was quietly sleeping on a cot in the cabin at the time of the explosion was wounded and today carry scars caused thereby some of my companions who were sleeping near me were instantly killed i jumped into the water first swimming back and taking hold of the side wheel i held on to it long enough to remove some of my clothing so that i could swim easier i then struck out with a determination to save my life and was only out of reach when that immense wheel that i had been holding to fell over into the water taking with it quite a number of persons to their watery grave after swimming some distance and making several hairbreadth escapes from drowning men and horses i came across a stage plank floating as a life preserver for ten or more persons one of whom was an engineer of said boat and who appeared to have control of the plank an invitation from the engineer to catch on was quickly accepted and i peacefully floated along with them we remained in the water until after daylight when we were picked up by the steamer jenny lind and were landed in safety at memphis tennessee one man was lost from the plank but ten lives were saved by it their names i am unable to give captain taggart and myself by permission of general washburn boated the next steamer for cairo illinois and from there by rail to indianapolis thence to columbus ohio where a few weeks later we were honorably discharged from the service after visiting friends and relations in different parts of ohio i went to iowa being at one time sheriff of marshall county have had the usual experiences of a western sheriff of shooting and being shot many men are now languishing within the walls of the penitentiary that surrendered only after a desperate struggle and overpowered by me were compelled to give in have been badly wounded and at one time my wounds were considered fatal but have nearly recovered and am now in reasonably good health i am at present employed in the bank of hanford my present post office address hanford california end of section eighty one Section 82 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 82. L. W. McCrory. I was born in Wayne County, Ohio, November 5, 1835, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Portage, Ohio, June 9, 1862, in Company A, 100th Regiment, Ohio Volunteer Infantry was captured at Limestone Station, East Tennessee, September 8, 1863, and confined in rebel prisons at Lynchburg, Belle Isle, Libby, and Andersonville, spending in all 22 months in those horrible dens, one year and seven days in Andersonville. With others, I was placed on the steamer Sultana. I took up my place on the cabin deck in the curve of the stair banister according to the best of my calculation the boat must have blown up about one o'clock in the morning the night was very dark and cloudy when the boiler burst it tore its way up through the hurricane deck which came crashing down and in all probability would have crushed me had it not been for the stair banister which held it up and saved me 
I soon crawled out of that and worked my way out on the small gangplank which was tacked up to what I think they called the gin pole. I took care to bring my valise and pocketbook along with me. The former contained a good suit of citizens' clothes, and the latter over a hundred dollars. I remained upon the plank until driven off by the fire. While here I saw the big gangplank shoved off. According to my remembrance, this plank was about forty feet long and six feet wide, and was heavily iron-bound. I believe it was the cause of the death of at least three hundred of the boys, for they were just as thick as they could cling around it, and I never heard of one that was saved by it. When the fire finally drove me to the water, fearful lest I should need one hand, I put my pocket book, which was an old-fashioned iron-bound one, between my teeth and hung on to my valise with one hand. It seemed to me that I never would come to the surface again, for I had jumped down at least eighteen feet to reach the water, and to add to my discomfort, my pocketbook kept my mouth partially open so that I took in some water, but still I managed to get along pretty well, and as the boys say, did not lose my head. Comrade John Cornwell of my company and regiment and myself swam together, but he was easily discouraged. After a while he called out to me that he could hold out no longer, but I cheered him up, urging him to try a little longer, telling him that I knew he was just as able to get out as I, and that I was not going to give up. He tried a while longer, and then cried out again that it was no use, he must sink. I urged him to hold on, but after we had gone about two miles, he called a third time, and sank immediately, and I saw him no more. This startled me a little. I had hung on to my valise all this time, changing it from one hand to the other, as either arm grew tired, but when Comrade Cornwell went down, I threw the valise away, but hung to my pocketbook, which, all this time, after I came up from my dive, I had gripped in my right hand with my little finger and the one next to it. Now what seems strange to me is that in a very short time after throwing away my valise, both arms became entirely helpless, and I was obliged to turn over on my back and float in order to rest them. After floating a while I swam a short distance when my arms gave out again, and I was forced to float once more but soon was able to swim again. I then experienced no more trouble with my arms. I soon came in contact with a log upon which I crawled, and where I remained until about nine o'clock the next day, when I was taken off by the steamer Pocahontas. While upon this log I saw a man reach an island who was pulled out by two of his comrades. I do not believe there was a particle of skin upon his entire body. He had been badly scalded, and it had all come off. His comrades were doing their best to keep the buffalo gnats off him. Whatever became of the poor fellow I never knew, but presumed that he died in a short time. About the first man I came across on the Pocahontas was a big darky who was dishing out hot sling unsparingly to the boys. I took a big drink, but it was not enough so I went up to the bar of the boat and called for brandy. The bartender set down a bottle and a small glass, but I called for a large one. He then set down a big beer tumbler. I filled this brimming full and drank it, then offered to pay for it, but he refused to take pay, saying, It is free to Sultana survivors. I told him that when he disposed of it by wholesale he ought to charge something. I was taken to the soldier's home and soon sent north on the steamer Silver Spray. At the time of my capture I had one bullet put through my canteen, three through my haversack, and my clothes were literally filled full of holes, but I did not get even a scratch of the skin. On the trip from Andersonville, Georgia to Columbus, Ohio, I was wrecked six times on the cars and once on a steamboat 
but was not injured a particle except a slightly sprained ankle received by jumping from the top of a box car about thirty feet down an embankment while the train was at full speed the train breaking in two part of it going down the embankment one way while i went down the other way my present occupation is farming and my post office address mungin ohio end of section eighty two Section 83 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 83. William A. McFarland. I enlisted during the first call for volunteers in 1861 in Company A, 42nd Indiana Infantry, at the age of 16 years. My first duty was to act in the capacity of marker boy but had not been out three months when I was carrying a gun with the other soldiers. I saw constant service until the 20th day of September, 1863, when I was captured by Longstreet's command at the Battle of Chickamauga in the second day's fight of that battle. We were skirmishing and were cut off from our command some time before we knew it. Our captors took us to Libby Prison, where we were kept for four months. Our rations at first consisted of about half of an ordinary loaf of bread and a small piece of beef, each for a day's ration, but the meat soon disappeared and we were left with nothing but the bread. I was taken with about 12,000 other prisoners from Libby to the Danville, Virginia prison, where we were kept about three months and then taken to the famous Andersonville prison, where we remained for 11 months more to suffer indescribable horrors. The cover we had overheard was the blue canopy of heaven, while we were surrounded on the four sides by a high wall and a strong-armed guard. When sleeping, we were obliged to huddle together to keep warm in the winter. Our food was of the very poorest kind, consisting principally of cornmeal. We were allowed to cook any articles we might buy, but were made to buy the wood to do the cooking with. One Irish potato would bring from seventy-five cents to a dollar and twenty-five cents, a tablespoon of coarse salt twenty to forty cents, and a handful of wood twenty-five cents, and in good United States money, too. Some of the prisoners had money and often bought such articles, but if they got much at a time they would be raided by their comrades. After the war had come to a close, the federal prisoners were taken from Andersonville and other prisons by the rebels, under a flag of truce, to Big Black River, twelve miles in the rear of Vicksburg, and turned over to the federal forces, after which we marched into Vicksburg. The government had chartered the steamer Sultana to convey four hundred prisoners north. The Sultana was a packet plying between New Orleans and St. Louis, and was chartered on or about April 23, 1865. The boat was loaded with 2,300 Union prisoners who were to be taken north to Camp Chase, Ohio. Before the boat had cleared the landing at Memphis, a number of the boys made their escape and went uptown and got whiskey. They were in no fit state to drink it, being in such a wretched condition from the treatment in the prisons and a guard was sent out to bring them back. The last to put in an appearance was a soldier hailing from Tennessee. He was a thin seven-footer, and he came down to the boat, shouting and cursing at the point of bayonet, so drunk he could hardly walk. He was brought up to the hurricane deck, where he caused considerable disturbance. I was quite young at that time, and it pleased me very much to tease this fellow. He tried to get at me, but the men were so thick he had to run over a number in trying to get to me, and received a number of hard licks for his trouble. When the Sultana was chartered, there were several families on board who were on their way from Louisiana to the north, and they were permitted to retain their staterooms. After we left Memphis, 
it began raining and continued to do so all that night when eight miles above memphis between two and three o'clock in the morning the boilers of the boat exploded i seemed to be dreaming and could hear someone saying there isn't any skin left on their bodies i awoke with a start and the next moment the boat was on fire and all was as light as day the wildest confusion followed some sprang into the river at once others were killed and i could hear the groans of the dying above the roar of the flames as before stated i was on the hurricane deck clear aft this part of the boat was jammed with men i saw the pilot house and hundreds of them sink through the roof into the flames, at which juncture I sprang overboard into the river. As I came to the surface of the water, I saw a woman rush out of a stateroom in her nightclothes with a little child in her arms. In a moment she had fastened a life preserver about its waist and then threw it overboard. The preserver had evidently been fastened on too low, for when the little one hit the water, it turned wrong end up. The mother rushed into the stateroom an instant, and was then out and sprang into the water and grabbed the child, all of which occurred in the space of a couple of minutes. The next thing that occupied my attention was seeing the seven-foot Tennessean, whom I had been teasing on the trip, close at my side. A guilty conscience needs no accuser, and I supposed he would drown me if he caught me. I began swimming away from him. I swam seven miles down the river and into a drift where I caught onto a log and awaited assistance. As day dawned, I found that hundreds had followed my example, and although it was a serious situation, I could not help laughing at the comical appearance that all made. Imagine my surprise when I observed that woman, whom I had witnessed plunge into the river after her baby, sitting astraddle of a log about twenty feet in front of me with the little one before her. We were both picked up by a yawl sent out by the steamer Silver Spray. The next person the yawl approached was my long Tennessee friend, who was comfortably seated on a log. He asked how far it was to Memphis, and when told only a mile, he said to the crew, "'Go to hell with your boat!' If you couldn't come to help me before now, you had better have stayed away. And with that he slid from his log and began swimming down the river. When the survivors arrived at Memphis that morning, all the hacks and omnibuses in the city were at the wharf to convey us to the Overton Hospital, now the Overton Hotel. There were enough conveyances for all, and none were compelled to walk. The seven-foot Tennessean had arrived at the landing by the time the silver spray did, but it was found that he was still under the influence of liquor, after all the excitement of the night, and when he began to get into the conveyance, he refused to ride. They tried to force him into a hack, but in the scuffle two or three soldiers were knocked down. A guard was detailed to march him through the streets to the hospital. On the way up we passed through a street inhabited mostly by Jews who kept second-hand clothing establishments, etc., and as the hack in which I was riding was slowly passing along the street, I could see that long Tennessean pulling off boots, shoes, hats, caps, and other articles from the signs hanging in front, and by the time he reached the hospital he had about a dozen Jews at his heels clamoring for their wares. "'Dot ish my goat!' said one, and, "'Dos vas my shoes!' said another, while a third would yell, "'Give me back my pants!' The Tennessean turned and, glaring at the crowd, threw the lot at his feet, saying, "'There, help yourselves!' And as he rushed forward and stooped over the pile, he began to knock them right and left. It was afterwards learned that out of 2,300 prisoners on the Sultana, 1,500 were either blown to pieces or drowned. The boat was totally destroyed. At the place where the wreck occurred, the river was miles wide, making escape almost impossible. 
After being at the hospital a few days, and not being injured, I made my escape, determining to reach home as soon as possible. The first boat that came along was the St. Patrick, a handsome steamer plying between Cincinnati and Memphis. Like a burnt child dreading the fire, I dreaded getting on a steamboat for fear of another explosion. Adopting what I supposed was the safest plan, I crawled into the yawl hanging over the stern of the boat, as all side-wheel packets have, and never left my quarters until I arrived at the wharf at Evansville. It rained most all the way up, but I stuck it through. Every time the boat would escape steam or blow the whistle, I prepared to jump, supposing an explosion was about to take place. End of section 83《Section 84 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 84. Eponidas W. McIntosh, late private of Company E and A, 14th Illinois Infantry. I embarked on the steamer Henry Ames at Vicksburg, with about 2,100 soldiers on board, returning from rebel prisons. I remained on said steamer until we arrived at Memphis, where we landed. I, supposing she would remain some time, went into town to look around and buy some articles I needed, and while gone she moved off and left me. Along in the evening the steamer Sultana landed, loaded with another lot of prisoners, so I embarked intending to go to Benton Barracks and join the comrades I had left on the Henry Ames. When some miles from the city, I cannot state the exact distance, she blew up and I was sent whirling into the water, which I reached without any trouble from the steam, although many were scalded to death before reaching it. As I struck the water, I heard groans and screams of agony on every side. Oh, the scene! It is impossible to describe. I knew that immediate action was necessary. I decided to keep back from the crowd, but found it was not an easy matter, as the drowning were making for any who could swim and catching at a straw. It was hard work to keep clear and save one own's life. I made for the shore, but it looked so far away in the mist of night that my courage almost failed me. After eight or ten hours I touched sand on the Arkansas shore. My strength was so near gone that I even came near having a watery grave. It was with much difficulty and suffering that I was enabled to walk or crawl onto dry land where a colored man saw me and came to my assistance. I needed such assistance very much as I was destitute of clothing, having stripped myself as I swam along to lighten the load. In twenty minutes after reaching land, I was bloated so much that I could scarcely see, and believed that if I had not been cared for at once I would have died. I remained there until the next day, when a boat came across the river picking up the boys, and they took me to Memphis Overton Hospital, where I remained two days. I was then put on a boat called the Belle of Memphis, and taken to Benton Barracks, and remained there until I got a furlough. During my prison life I suffered agonies untold. Tongue cannot tell it all, but this awful struggle for life in the waters was above all else I ever endured. Owing to the necessity of constant motion, without rest to any part of the body, being reduced to a mere skeleton through being confined in rebel prisons, was in my favor, as I could never have survived that awful disaster had I weighed as much as I did before my prison experience. My weight now was eighty pounds. I was captured at Ackworth, Georgia, about the 4th of October, 1864, and exchanged at Vicksburg, April 15, 1865. Was in Andersonville most of the time. When I was captured I weighed 175 pounds. 
I will never go back on the old flag. Although somewhat palsied and greatly maimed, I can give three hearty cheers for the red, white, and blue, and set a rebel back if he comes to the front almost as quickly as I could when in possession of all my powers. Post Office Address, Decatur, Illinois End of Section 84section eighty five of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section eighty five daniel mcleod i was a member of company f eighteenth regiment illinois volunteer infantry and at the battle of pittsburg landing april sixth eighteen sixty two was shot in the right knee with round musket ball which caused a compound fracture of the knee joint. This wound was examined on the battleground by Assistant Surgeon Ormsby of the 18th Regiment, afterwards Surgeon of the 45th Illinois, who stated that the leg would have to be cut off above the knee, but that he was too busy at that time to attend to it. I have the affidavits of two comrades who heard Dr. Ormsby make the assertion. I was taken from the battlefield on the steamer War Eagle to Cincinnati, Ohio, and was put in the 4th Street Hospital, and there treated by Dr. F. Schmidt, who cut the ball out of the knee joint and removed part of the fractured bones. Doctors Norton and J. B. Smith were consulted in the case by Dr. Schmidt. Dr. Norton said that the only way to treat such a case was to cut the boy's leg off, that in case he did recover, what end would it serve, as the limb would be of no use? From the 4th Street Hospital I was removed to the Washington Park Hospital. While I was there I was examined by the medical purveyor of the department, Dr. Carpenter, in the presence of Drs. J. B. Smith and Norton. Dr. Norton then explained the nature and character of the wound, and also stated what he, Norton, had recommended. Dr. Carpenter said that was the course that should be taken in cases of a like character always. On June 7, 1863, I was removed to Camp Denison, Ohio, August 7 to Quincy, Illinois, receiving my final United States discharge from there in June 1864. I was then examined by the United States Pension Surgeon at Springfield, Illinois, and granted eight dollars per month pension, the full pension at that time for entire disability. I was never able to make any use of that leg. I was a passenger on the steamer Sultana en route from New Orleans to St. Louis. When the steamer reached Vicksburg, one of the boilers was leaking and was patched by Klein's foundry men before the soldiers were put on board. There was no necessity of loading the Sultana so heavily, as the steamers Pauline Carroll and Lady Gay were at the landing coming up light, but the clerk and captain of the Sultana were part owners of the boat, and I understood at the time that they put up money to get the transportation of the soldiers, which the officers of the other boats, having no interest, would not do. The hold of the Sultana was full of sugar and nearly every stateroom was taken in the cabin, besides a number of deck passengers. According to my remembrance, there were taken on at Vicksburg 1,940 enlisted men, 40 officers, and a company of the 54th Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry as guards. The night of the explosion, being tired from the long trip, I sat up reading at a table in the center of the cabin, and when the explosion took place, I was blown over the table, being, as it were, on the outer edge of the crater. All nearer the bow went up and down in the chasm made by the explosion. Both my legs were broken at the ankle. When the boat began to burn, which it did at once, every one that was able rushed to the guards. While I was dragging myself out, the captain of the 54th Ohio came and pulled me out to the guards. I at once climbed down on the hog chains to where they had broken off and let myself drop into the water, which was full of the wreck and men trying to escape. 
but not so many as there were shortly afterward when the flames forced them to take to the water. I had been brought up near the water and was a good swimmer, so I floated down the river about two miles and lodged in the brush on Cheeks Island, above Memphis. In the morning I was picked up and taken to Memphis and placed in Adams Hospital, in charge of surgeon J. M. Studley, who, after examining my fractures, told me that it was no use trying to save my right leg, as it was in such a condition from the previous wound that it would be practically impossible to save it, and that he would have to cut it off above the old wound. This he did, and set the broken bones of the other leg, and soon both were healed. My present post office address is 818 Market Street, St. Louis, Missouri. End of section 85section eighty six of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section eighty six l g morgan i was born in perry county ohio september fourteenth eighteen thirty seven and enlisted in the service of the united states at findlay ohio september nineteenth eighteen sixty one in company d one hundred and twenty first regiment ohio volunteer infantry i with others was captured near kingston georgia and taken to cahaba alabama our rations consisted of a pint of corn meal and five ounces of beef daily and in addition to this we would get a few beans or negro peas about two or three spoonsful to the man we were divided into companies of one hundred men each and one man appointed as orderly sergeant for each company to draw and divide rations. We planned a way of escape, but failed in doing so. The guards tried to persuade us to tell who the leaders of the conspiracy were, but we refused to do so. They then read an order that all rations would be stopped unless we did, but still we refused. The most of us made up our minds that we would rather starve than betray our comrades. After going through various forms of punishment, someone finally told, and the conspirators were severely punished. After that things moved along quietly, nothing of importance happening, only the usual tunneling and getting caught at it. Finally the time came for us to be exchanged, and after signing a parole of honor, pledging the rebs that we would not try to escape, we took a boat and went to Selma, Alabama, where we remained overnight. In the morning we walked about two miles to take the train, one of the men dying on the way from overeating the night before. We got along all right until we reached Jackson, Mississippi. Here we went into camp and baked enough cornbread to last us through to Vicksburg, we reached Black River, where we remained overnight. The next morning we were exchanged and marched across the river into God's country once more. To say that we were glad would be putting it in a very mild form. We remained in camp for about six weeks, and at last the time came for us to go north, so we marched to Vicksburg, a distance of about four miles, and were put on board the steamer Sultana. When about half of us were on board, the captain of the boat stopped us and said that he had enough, for he did not consider the boat safe enough to take so many as he had just had the boiler patched a few days before. The quartermaster, however, who had charge of us, swore that he was loading the boat and would put as many men on as he pleased. We were so crowded that it was difficult to find a place to lie down to sleep. The boiler, cabin, and hurricane decks were all full. There were two thousand soldiers and two hundred passengers, besides some seven hundred hogsheads of sugar, and I think about thirty or forty mules and other freight. When we reached Memphis, we unloaded sugar and took on coal. I think it was about one or two o'clock a.m. when we started up the river again, and when about seven miles above Memphis, the boiler exploded. I was sleeping in front of the smokestacks on the cabin deck. 
I got up and looked around. It would be impossible for me to describe the scene. My first thought was to get some buckets and put the fire out, but not seeing any and being afraid to venture over the wreck, I jumped off and swam to the stern of the boat, then got on again, but could not find any. Then someone asked me to help throw off the dead men, for it looked hard to see them burn. We threw off five or six. One poor fellow was pinned down by the wreck and begged someone to help him out. I tried to, but the timbers were so heavy that I could not get him loose, and so I had to let him burn to death. A man by the name of Henry Spaffer, who belonged to the 102nd Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry, came to me and said, "'Morgan, what am I going to do? I cannot swim.' I told him to get a plank, but he said he could not find any. I found a good one, threw it into the water, and made him jump in after it. I then thought it time to get off myself, as the fire was getting pretty hot. I watched my chance and finally started. Being a good swimmer, I did not take anything to help me along with. My only fear was that someone would get hold of me and pull me down and I would drown. I must have swam very rapidly, for I passed a number of fellows in the water. I swam along till I got close to the timber, but it was right at a bend in the river, and the current was so strong that before I could reach it, I was carried below it into the river again. I went along for a while seeing no one, but after a short time someone called out, "'Hello, Morgan, is that you?' I replied, "'Yes. It was Spaffer who hailed me. I was nearly used up, for my legs were badly cramped. Spaffer floated a board to me, and that helped me along. We swam down the river together and finally landed on some driftwood. Soon after sunrise we were picked up by the steamer Rocket. The barkeeper on the boat sent a boy around with a pitcher full of whiskey, and we each had a large glassful. When we reached Memphis, the women of the Christian Commission gave us some shirts and drawers and took us to a place called a soldier's home, but they had no blankets for us to sleep on. After we had something to eat, I started to go through the city, bareheaded and barefooted, and while passing a store owned by a Jew, the proprietor came out and asked me if I had been on the boat. I answered in the affirmative, and he gave me a hat, one of the clerks giving me a pair of shoes. A little further up the street I met an artilleryman, and he said if I would come with him to his quarters he would give me a pair of pants. I accompanied him, and while there another artillery boy gave me a blouse. I got my supper with them and then went to a hospital, where I was provided with a cot to sleep upon. In the morning as I was going down the street I saw a sign on a building and it said, Soldier's Lodge. That was kept by the Christian Commission, and the soldier's home was kept by the Sanitary Commission. I went in, and they said that I could stay. I was there for five or six days when we took a boat for Cairo, Illinois. From there we took the cars and went to Mattoon, thence via Indianapolis, Indiana, to Columbus, Ohio, remaining there for six weeks. We then received our discharge and went home. I think about the last of May or first of June. Post office address Findlay, Ohio. End of section eighty six. Section eighty seven of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section eighty seven. A. J. Morning. I was a member of Company D, 11th Regiment Illinois Cavalry, and was stationed at Memphis at the time the explosion took place on the morning of the 27th of April, 1865. A detail of us was sent to the wharf very early to unload hay. We were immediately put into a yawl and succeeded in rescuing a number of the poor fellows from the Sultana. We worked at it till about two o'clock in the afternoon. My post office address is Toledo, Ohio. 
End of section 87. Section 88 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 88. A. Nyhart. I was born in Hawking County, Ohio, June 11, 1842, and enlisted in the service of the United States at Logan, Hawking County, Ohio, June 1862, in Company G, 90th Regiment, Ohio Infantry was captured at Spring Hills, Tennessee, November 1864, and confined in the Andersonville, Georgia prison. Occupation, farming. Post office, Bolivar, Missouri. End of section 88. Section 89 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 89. C. M. Nisley. I was born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania on the 19th of May, 1838. Enlisted in Company D of the 40th Regiment, Indiana Infantry, on the 29th of October, 1861, at Lafayette, Indiana, and took part in all the engagements that the regiment participated in, until taken prisoner at the Battle of Franklin, Tennessee, on the 30th of November, 1864. I was captured about eight o'clock in the evening, with nineteen hundred others, and hurried to Columbia, Tennessee, and held there until a few days before the Second Battle of Nashville under Pap Thomas, when we were removed to Meridian, Mississippi, and from thence to Cahaba, Alabama, where we were confined in a prison called Castle Morgan. This place was on the Alabama River, 27 miles from Selma, and where the Cahaba River empties into the Alabama. We were kept here until, in the spring of 1865, when the river arose till the water was from 18 inches to 3 feet deep in our prison, and we were forced to stand in the water as we could not lie down for three days. We were then put upon the steamer Henry J. King, and taken down the river to the Tom Bigby, and up that river to Gainesville, Alabama, then back by way of Meridian, Mississippi, to Jackson, and from there to the Big Black River, and then were taken to the neutral camp near Vicksburg, Mississippi, where we rested and cleaned up for about ten days. We were next taken over to Vicksburg, and went on board the steamer Sultana. Starting up the river, we arrived at Memphis, Tennessee, on the evening of the 26th of April, 1865. The steamer crossed the river to the coal barges and took on a supply of coal, and shortly after midnight, or virtually on the morning of the 27th of April, started up the river again and had run about seven miles when the explosion took place. At the time of the explosion, I was lying on the forepart of the passenger deck. The smokestack fell through the hurricane deck, instantly killing John Howard of Company H, 40th Indiana Infantry, and pinned me fast to the deck, but after a few moments of struggling I succeeded in extricating myself. I then started to help put out the fire, but I fell through the decks, hurting my back seriously, besides getting badly burned and scalded. I immediately set about helping to extricate those who were caught fast by pieces of the boat. After this, in company with Captain Mason of the Sultana, I threw over broken pieces of the boat and other materials for those already in the water, but after a little time the fire became so hot that I was obliged to take to the water. A great many had sunk to rise no more, and there were but few floating and swimming about that would be liable to drag me down. Captain Mason was the last man I talked with while on board the boat, and he was still on the boat when I left. I managed to get hold of a piece of studding about ten feet long, and with its assistance swam and floated about five miles down the river when I caught on to a small cottonwood tree on the Arkansas shore and hung there till about ten o'clock when I was picked up by the steamer Bostonia and taken to a hospital at Memphis, 
where I remained a few days. Was then sent to Cairo and thence to Indianapolis. Here I received a ten days furlough to go to my home, Lafayette. When this expired, I, having received a commission as first lieutenant, started to join my regiment, which was at Lavaca, Texas, but was taken with typhoid fever and came near dying, so at last took my discharge and returned to my home, hoping to hear the sound of war no more. I am now over fifty years of age, but should my country ever need my services, I am as ready and willing as before to give them. Captain Hazelage of Company K, 40th Indiana Infantry, was quartermaster of the troops on the boat, and I was his assistant, helping to issue the rations. As near as I can remember, there were 1,966 enlisted men and 36 commissioned officers on board the boat. I was afterward a victim before the court of inquiry that investigated the cause of the explosion, and I will say now, as I did then, that in my opinion the boilers were defective, the boat overloaded, and the pumps not working properly, which led to the explosion. I do not believe in the torpedo story. It does not look reasonable to me. My present post office address is 36 Elizabeth Street, Lafayette, Indiana. My occupation is traveling salesman, but for the past year have not been able to do much. End of section 89section ninety of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section ninety john w norcutt i was born in litchfield hillsdale county michigan on the first day of july eighteen thirty eight and enlisted at allen michigan december seventeenth eighteen sixty three in company d eighteenth regiment michigan infantry I was captured at Athens, Alabama, September 22, 1864, and confined in the rebel prison at Cahaba, Alabama. With others of my regiment, I was on board the ill-fated steamer Sultana, and when the boat took fire, I sprang into the river. I succeeded in securing two pieces of cabin flooring, and placing one of these under each arm, I floated down the river till I came to an island that was overflowed. Here I caught hold of some small trees, and held on till rescued by a steamer and taken to Memphis. I think I was in the water about four hours. I was in the hospital after this fourteen days before I could stand alone. My present occupation is mail carrier, and my post office address, Campbell, Michigan. End of section 90 Section 91 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 91. Albert Norris. I was born in Muskingum County, Ohio, on the 17th of March, 1842. Enlisted in the service of the United States at Newark, Ohio, on the 18th of February, 1864, in Company A, 76th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, as a private. Was taken prisoner at Little River, Georgia, on the 26th of October, 1864, by the 51st Alabama Regiment, Confederate, while on detail made by the Colonel to forage. Was taken to Cahaba, Alabama, where I remained until I was paroled out on the 18th of March, 1865, and sent to Vicksburg, Mississippi, and remained in camp at Big Black River until the 24th of April, when I took passage on the cabin deck of the steamer Sultana for Cairo, Illinois. At half-past one on the morning of the 27th of April, 1865, I was lying asleep on the cabin deck of the boat, just in front and nearly over the furnace, when one of her boilers exploded, blowing the center part of the boat into the river. I fell to the boiler deck upon the hot irons of the furnace, 
burning my left arm and shoulder to a crisp. The men in the hurricane deck fell upon me, and it was some time before I became conscious of my surroundings. After the men got off me, getting my right arm loose, I removed the boards that held me down and got on my feet. Securing a cracker barrel that had one head in, I jumped over the high railing around the center of the boat into the deep water. Comrade Stone, of Newark, Ohio, got a coal box and threw it and the barrel into the river. I caught both of them and gave him the box and kept the barrel for my own use. We started out for the Tennessee shore, and he floated downstream about seven miles below where the explosion took place, or to Memphis, Tennessee, where he was picked up. My feet became entangled in my underclothing, and in trying to loosen them I came near drowning. I swam about a mile when I saw the steamer Bostonia anchoring within two hundred yards above the burning wreck. I swam close to her when three men in a small boat took me in and carried me to the rescuing steamer. This boat carried one hundred of us to Memphis, Tennessee. I remained in the Washington and Gayozo hospitals under the physician's care for three weeks when Dr. Shipley of Nashport and my brother, William A. Norris, came to Memphis for me. I returned home to Frazeyburg and then reported to Camp Chase, Ohio, and was discharged from the service on the 30th of June, 1865. My recollections are that there were 2,200 on board the Sultana, and 1,600 were lost. I saw one man going down the river on a large slab, hollowing, here goes your schooner for Memphis. Some prayed, some swore, and some sang. It was worse than any battle I was ever in. Since my discharge, I have been agent and telegraph operator for the PHRR Company sixteen years, and am now engaged in the mercantile business at Union Station, Ohio. End of section 91「Section 92 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 92. Joseph B. Norris. I was born in Salem Township, Tuscarawas County, Ohio, November 25, 1841, and enlisted in the service of the United States, September 9, 1861, in Company C. 51st Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Was taken prisoner at Chickamauga, September 20th, 1863, and confined in the Pemberton Building at Richmond, Virginia for two months, at Dansville, Virginia six months, and Andersonville, Georgia ten months. Was exchanged at Vicksburg, Mississippi, March 25th, 1865 making in all eighteen months and five days a prisoner of war. On April 25th, we received orders for all of the paroled prisoners belonging to the states of Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, and Kentucky to take the train to Vicksburg, our camp being four miles in the rear of the city, as we were to take a steamer that evening to go north. We were placed on board the steamer Sultana. I think the list of prisoners numbered 1,964, with one company of the 58th Ohio and two pieces of artillery as guard, besides cabin passengers and boat's crew. We steamed out of Vicksburg between 4 and 5 o'clock p.m. on the 24th, and reached Memphis a little before sundown on the 26th, where we tied up and uploaded quite a number of hogsheads of sugar. The Sultana also took on coal at this point. I think it was about half-past twelve or one o'clock in the morning of the 27th that the boat left Memphis. That was the last that I knew until after the explosion. I had gone to sleep and was on the hurricane deck at the time. I did not hear the report, but was awakened by the cries of my comrades who were running to and fro. Some were screaming, some were praying, 
and others were shouting and telling the boys to keep cool. I tell you, it was a hard place to keep cool, with the flames sweeping all around. I first went to the Arkansas side to jump overboard, but there were too many there in the water for me. I then went to the Tennessee side and found the same trouble. I started for the boat's stern, tearing off my drawers and shirt as I went. Finding things no better there, I thought I would wait until the boat would float down from among the men who were drowning in the water. Just then a strong breeze drove the flame so close as to make it unpleasant, and thinking it about as easy to drown as to burn, I started for the bottom of the Mississippi. I did not quite get there, but coming to the surface I started for shore. After swimming for a long time and being almost chilled to death, I landed in the top of some brush, to which I held till daylight, when I saw a good-sized sycamore log that had lodged in the brush about thirty feet from where I then was. I pulled myself from bush to bush as I was past swimming, and my legs were entirely benumbed with cold. I reached the log after some fifteen or twenty minutes' hard work and pulled myself upon it. All the time I was holding on to the brush in the water, I could hear the boys that had got into trees, as it began to get daylight, crowing like roosters and crying, "'Here's your mule!' It was about seven o'clock before I was able to crow. I was picked up by the United States picket boat Pocahontas about ten o'clock a.m. April 27th without a stitch of clothing on my back, and pretty well tired out as well as peppered by the bites of buffalo gnats. After donning a shirt, given to me by a couple of sanitary ladies, and a pair of overalls from one of the firemen, and drinking a couple of glasses of something that did not look or taste altogether like spring water, I was ready for breakfast, which was on the kitchen table of the Pocahontas. I had not eaten at a table for nearly four years, and was rather awkward, but got there just the same. Post office address is Randolph, Nebraska. End of section 92section 93 of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section 93 j e norton i enlisted at pontiac michigan in august 1862 as a sergeant in company a of the fifth michigan cavalry i was captured the last time at trevilian station virginia with 500 of our brigade custer June 11, 1864, and imprisoned in Libby ten days, Pemberton building a few days, and then shipped by cars to Andersonville, Georgia, where I remained until removed to Millen Prison in September following. Was in the latter prison but a short time when Kilpatrick, trying to capture us with a scouting detachment from Sherman's army, drove us out and the rebels took us to Savannah there to put us on the gulf road and run us down finally to blackshear then to thomasville and from there across the country to americus georgia taking the road again we came back to andersonville some time in december where we remained during the winter early in the spring of eighteen sixty five we were ordered to be sent to vicksburg where on arriving we went on board the steamer sultana we were placed on this steamer by that careless officer general dana who had charge of shipping all the soldiers at that point may he never be forgotten as a type of first-class don't care for the boys who were returning to their long looked for home and loved ones on the morning of the twenty seventh of april eighteen sixty five i found myself waking from a stupor or unconsciousness produced by a blow which i received at the time of the explosion upon the head just back of the center part of the brain i was pinned or held down by the timbers or materials of some sort and felt a smarting sensation on my face tried to raise my hand but was so pinned down that i could not 
I struggled and finally loosened myself only to find I was in darkness. I did not apprehend at all what was the matter, nor was I in the least cognizant of my surroundings, for everything was all right when I went to sleep, just as we pushed off from the dock at Memphis a few hours before. My quarters upon the faded boat were in the center of the upper deck and ten feet in front of the smokestack. The boilers being back of the smokestack prevented my being thrown into the water. I remember distinctly of hearing a noise caused by the explosion, and can only describe the noise by measurement. Being a mechanic I can do no other way. It appeared to be about one and one-half inch long, and then all was blank until I awoke one half hour afterward. Not a sound could I hear but the splashing of water could see nothing and was in great wonderment of mind as to the trouble I felt I was surrounded by. Presently I heard voices on the end of the boat crying, "'Put out that fire! Put out that fire!' I looked and discovered a fire breaking out above the deck, about the size of the crown of a hat. It grew rapidly and soon illuminated the awful scene." The thoughts that came rushing upon me were simply appalling and too terrible for my description. I looked for something that was loose on which I could float, but could find nothing. I crawled down to the lower deck, the only one which was not broken up, and, as I was so doing, a hand reached up from below me and caught my ankles, and I heard someone saying, "'Help me out!' A timber prevented them from getting out, and I tried to raise it, but could not quite. A comrade came crawling along, bent upon reaching the lower deck, and helped me to raise the timber from off three or four men, and thus saved them from being burned to death. When I reached the deck I found a box, which I made use of in floating, although I was a good swimmer. Thinking that I must be in the water for a long time before relief might come, I remained on board the boat until the fire drove me off and then jumped into the water. While I was swimming away from the burning wreck, a man attacked me and wanted my box. I moved the box sideways enough for him to miss his clutch upon it, but he caught me by the hip and we both went down under water farther than I ever went before or since. I finally came to the surface of the water, but so weak from having taken water into my lungs that I could scarcely keep up, and if it had not been for the box I think I would have drowned. About fifteen feet away from me I saw a bale of hay with a soldier boy lying across it, which I made the greatest physical effort to reach. I finally made it, and putting my arm upon one corner and with the box under the other arm, I was soon able to disgorge some of the water from my lungs. As soon as I could speak, I assured the soldier boy that I would not sink his bale of hay. He was piteously begging me not to, as he could not swim. I told him to keep a lookout and not let anyone get on with us. I found by careful observation that it would support both of us with the use of my box under one arm. The water was cold and chilly, and but for my care the boy would have fallen off and drowned. I kept him using his limbs, so as to keep the blood in circulation and thus prevent chilling so much. We floated down the river opposite to Memphis, where we were picked up by the steamer Bostonia, which was on her trip to the wreck, and we were afterwards landed at Memphis. I remained about a month at Memphis, and then came north to Columbus, Ohio, thence to Jackson, Michigan, where I was discharged from the service in June 1865. My present occupation is model and pattern making. Post office address, 62 Duffield Street, Detroit, Michigan. End of section 93《ラスト・ド・ o ルタナ》by Chester D. Berry。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Section 94 William H. Norton
I was born in Northampton Township, Summit County, Ohio, February 17, 1841. I enlisted in the service of the United States in Northampton, the 11th day of August, 1862, in Company C, 115th Ohio Volunteer Infantry. I am 45 years of age, October 25, 1886, and my residence at the present time is Hudson, Ohio. My occupation is farming. Was a corporal at the time of my discharge from the service, which discharge I received at Camp Chase, Ohio, May 25, 1865. I was captured at Laverne, Tennessee, December 5, 1864, by General Forrest's command at the time of Hood's raid on Nashville, Tennessee. We were started on a forced march to the Tennessee River. At a place near Florence, we boarded the cars for Meridian, Mississippi. I remained there in prison about ten weeks, and was then sent to Cahaba, Alabama, where I remained until the 1st of March, 1865. The river rose very high, and the prison was overflowed. The water in the prison was two or three feet deep, and I was sent to Selma, from there to Camp Fisk, near Vicksburg, Mississippi. I went on board the steamer Sultana, April 25, 1865. At the time of the explosion, I was sleeping on the forward part of the upper deck and was awakened by the explosion and cries of the wounded. Men were rushing to and fro, trampling over each other in their endeavors to escape. All was confusion. Soon the flames came leaping up, and I now realized that the boat was on fire. I stood for a few minutes and listened to that awful wail of hundreds of human beings burning alive in the cabin and under the fallen timbers. I tried to get down to the lower deck, found it impossible to go down by the stairway on account of the fire, but fortunately discovered a rope, and by the aid of that landed on the lower deck. There the men were jumping into the river by the hundreds. The river was full of men struggling with each other and grasping at everything that offered any means of support. The boat was fast burning up, and the flames had reached within a few feet of me, and I knew that there was but one way of escape, the deep, dark waters of the Mississippi. I took off my shoes and clothing, except underclothing, and jumped overboard. As I arose to the surface, several men from the boat jumped upon me, and we all went down together. Others leaping on us forced us down until I despaired of ever reaching the surface again. But by a desperate struggle, I succeeded in getting out from under them and reached the surface. I tried to swim through the crowd of men, but could not. One man caught hold of me, but I managed to get away from him and not knowing what to do or which way to go, I instinctively turned toward the burning boat. Reaching that and swimming alongside, I found the ring which is used in tying up the boat. I had no sooner caught hold of it than a drowning man clasped his arms around me in a death grip. I told him he must let go, but it was of no use. He never said a word, but all the while I could feel his arms tightening around me. Hanging on to the ring with one hand, I tried to free myself from him with the other, but could not. The situation was becoming terrible. To let go the ring was death to both of us. The strain on my arm was such that I could not hold out but a few minutes longer. Another man now got hold of the ring, and still another grasped him by the throat and a desperate struggle was going on between them. The wheelhouse had now burned loose and fell over with a crash. It seemed to me that the boat was going to pieces. With all the strength I had, I made another effort to free myself from the drowning man, and was successful, and once more struck out into the river. This time I had no difficulty in getting through, as the men had become more scattered. A few rods ahead of me was a small box, ten by sixteen inches square, which I soon overtook, and placing it under my arm, 
I found it to be quite a help, but it would not support me. Looking off some distance in the darkness, I saw a light, and supposing it must be a boat out picking up the men, I now made an effort to reach it, but it grew dimmer and dimmer, and finally disappeared altogether. I think it must have been the deckhands with the yawl boat. I turned in another direction, hoping that I could reach the shore, but the darkness was so intense, except towards the burning boat, that no trace of the shore could be seen. Suffering with a cramp in my stomach, benumbed with the cold, it seemed as if I could go no farther, but if I stopped swimming I found myself sinking, and again would try to keep afloat. In this way I kept along. I could hear the cries of those that were burned and scalded screaming with pain at every breath, and men all along the river were calling for help. Away in the distance, floating down the river, was a burning boat with a few brave men fighting the fire with buckets of water. Looking to my left, I thought I could see the trees through the darkness. This gave me new courage, and I turned in that direction, and soon some brush struck me in the face. A little farther on, I was washed up against a log, which had caught in the young cottonwood trees. About nine o'clock in the morning of April 27th, a man in a canoe rowed me over to the Arkansas shore. I had landed on an island which was overflowed with water. Was told by the man that had rescued me that I had landed between two or three miles below where the Sultana exploded. End of section 94《セクション95オブ・ロス・オブ・ザ・サルタナ》by Chester D. Berry。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。セクション95。Stuart Oxley。I was born in Coshocton County, Ohio, on the 20th day of May, 1842. Enlisted in the service of the United States, November 18, 1861, in Company I of the 51st Regiment, Ohio Volunteer Infantry. Which was organized at Camp Miggs in Tuscarawas County and was assigned to the Army of the Cumberland. Was taken prisoner near Dallas, Georgia, May twenty sixth, eighteen sixty four, and confined at Selma and Cahaba, Alabama, and Meridian, Mississippi, until about the tenth of March, eighteen sixty five, when we came into God's Country at the Big Black River Bridge near Vicksburg, Mississippi. In dividing off into companies at Vicksburg, I was tented with some of the 50th Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry boys, and one, Albert Hunter, of the 10th Ohio Cavalry, and I, were bunkmates, and when we went aboard the steamer Sultana, we took our places on the cabin stoop on the left or west side, just to the rear and next to the cabin door. One or the other of us was there all the time. I was sick at the time and was seldom away from our places of abode. On the afternoon of April 26th, we arrived at Memphis, Tennessee. Just about the time we started from Memphis, we spread our blankets and lay down to rest and sleep. I went to sleep very soon, as I have no remembrance of anything after that until I was strangling in the water. I never felt or heard the explosion. Or anything that transpired at the time of the wreck, which occurred about two o'clock on the morning of the twenty seventh of April, about seven or eight miles above Memphis, farther than my striking on a piece of the wreck. In my struggle, I got hold of the piece of wrecking and started on my lonely voyage of seven or eight miles with the current as a moving power. Soon after, I became aware there was a man on the other end of my craft. Up to this time, I could not imagine what had happened that I should be in the water. My companion told me that the boat was on fire. I did not remember anything after this until we came opposite to Memphis, and while passing near the gunboat anchored in the river, I think one or the other of us must have shouted and given the alarm. About four o'clock in the morning, some of the boat's crew overtook us, and we were taken out of the water. 
in all this time i did not suffer in mind or body nor was i sensible of my danger or surroundings i don't think i made any effort to save myself at all after i was taken into the boat i don't remember as they picked up any more before we got to the gunboat or not but i think they did not they started back for the gunboat as we were put on to the deck the surgeon poured a glass of whiskey down each one and the men of the crew took off our wet clothing cut down their hammocks for us to lie on and did everything possible for our comfort the gunboat soon got under way and after doing all that could be done they came to and landed us at memphis i was carried on a stretcher to the overton hospital where i remained four weeks less one day my ribs on one side were cracked and broken my back was badly injured and the right side of my face and head scalded in the list of those saved i could never find the name of hunter who was sleeping on the same blanket with me and i never learned the name of the comrade that was on the piece of wreckage with me of my suffering and good nursing and kind treatment by the good sisters while in the hospital and my journey home for want of space i must pass over i arrived at camp chase ohio may twenty eighth eighteen sixty five and was discharged from the service the next day engaged in farming and mechanical labor my post office address burr oak iowa end of section ninety five Section ninety six of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section ninety six. Thomas Pangle. I was born in Madisonville, Monroe County, Tennessee, on the eighteenth day of September, eighteen forty five. My parents are E. S. and H. J. Pangle, and are still living in McMinn County, Tennessee. I was raised on a farm and enlisted in the service of the United States at the age of eighteen years. I still have my order of discharge, and by reference to it I see a few items of interest. I was enrolled at Nashville, Tennessee, January 12, 1864, to serve three years or until the war was over, in Company K, Captain John N. Morton, 3rd Regiment, Tennessee Cavalry, and was discharged June 10, 1865, at Nashville, Tennessee. I was engaged in no regular battle during my service, spending most of my time with my comrades on skirmish duty. I surrendered under Colonel Campbell at Athens, Alabama, September 24, 1864, and was incarcerated in prison at Cahaba, Alabama, until March 7, 1865, and returned to our lines March 16th at Camp Fisk, Mississippi. I went on board the ill-fated Sultana at Vicksburg, Mississippi, April 24th or 25th, 1865, with about 2,000 other ex-prisoners. All survivors of the terrible explosion well remember the morning of April 27th, 1865, when a few miles above Memphis, so many true and loyal lives were suddenly hurled into eternity it was most heart-rending to witness and the recollections of the terrible sufferings of my unfortunate comrades and their heroic efforts to swim to the shore and so many not succeeding who sank to the bottom of the river is most pitiable to think of it was an affair in the history of the rebellion that should be immortalized and all survivors should praise their maker for their escape i remember well that eventful morning i was sleeping with rob reed billy milton and jim esters and we were bunking about fifteen feet from the boiler when the explosion occurred we supposed at first that we were being fired at from the shore but soon realized our mistake i was very much crippled up with rheumatism and could scarcely use my limbs, but being an expert swimmer, I concluded to go ashore. I seized a board and plunged into the water, but so cold was the water that I soon became powerless to swim, and determined to climb up on the deck of the steamer, 
where there were many throwing water on the burning coal, etc. We succeeded in remaining on the deck until eight or nine o'clock, when we were rescued by parties from the Arkansas shore, and, finally, was taken aboard the steamer Pocahontas and taken to Memphis. Among those of the passengers on the Sultana I remember John Hamilton, Robert Hamilton, DeWitt Harris, George W. Maxwell, Solomon Bogard, and Harlan Jones. End of section 96section 97 of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section 97 joshua s patterson i am a resident of franklin township columbiana county ohio served in the army as a private in company f 104th ohio volunteer infantry enlisted in the service near Bethel Church on the 1st of September, 1862. I was captured at the Battle of Franklin, Tennessee, November 30, 1864, and taken to Andersonville Prison, where I remained until I was liberated, April 20, 1865. Discharged from the service May 20, 1865, at Camp Chase, Columbus, Ohio. Farming is my present occupation. The following is a brief account of my experience in making my escape from the steamer Sultana. I was awakened from my slumbers about three o'clock on the morning of the 27th of April, 1865, by a terrible crash. I knew not what, but afterwards found it to be the result of the explosion. As I arose from my bed, which was at the head of the first flight of stairs, I received a blow on the top of my head which caused a severe wound, the mark of which I carry to this day. This wound was inflicted, I think, by a piece of timber, it being so dark I could not ascertain how it did occur. Realizing my danger, and perceiving the unusual position of the boat, I jumped down on the lower deck, and there observed more fully the horrors of our situation. I had nothing to hope from human aid, only from the mercy of the Almighty. Dejection filled my mind, the consternation became general, nothing but sighs and groans were heard, even the animals that were on board uttered the most dreadful cries. Everyone began to raise his heart and hands toward heaven, and in the certainty of a speedy death each was occupied only with the melancholy alternative between the two elements of nature ready to devour us. The fire broke out in the vicinity of the boilers, which caused the soldiers to rush with tiger-like fury to the opposite extremity of the boat, or to that part farthest from the flames, without regard to rank, position, or life, using the vain prerogative, men jump into the water. Thus many poor hapless beings were pushed overboard by the pressure of the horrified and stricken mass of humanity. The confusion was extreme. Some seemed to anticipate death by jumping into the river. Others, by swimming, gained the fragments of the boat, while the ropes along the side were being covered by the men who were suspending from them, as if hesitating between two extremes equally imminent and equally terrible. Being one of the number who were pushed overboard, and not versed in the art of swimming, and unable to battle with the billowy waves, which rushed who and fro bounding like so many madmen, I realized that life would soon be extinct, and that it did not seem uncertain for what fate Providence intended me. Fortunately, as I arose from the bosom of the deep, I grasped a spar of timber which projected from the hull of the boat, and having hung there until my physical powers were nearly exhausted, in the meantime disengaging myself from two or three of my drowning companions, who came up and caught hold of my clothing. At this critical moment I observed a large piece of timber floating near me, and by a special effort secured it, which I used to good advantage, being able to keep myself above water. Having floated around to the other side of the boat, I observed men drawing their fellow victims out of the water by means of ropes. 
Availing myself of this opportunity, I grasped one of these with a death-like grip, but feeling my utter exhaustion, I put my arms through the noose of the rope, and was thus drawn up into the portion of the boat which had not yet sunk. In the meantime, a man and his son had come to the rescue with their raft, and by this means I was transferred from the burning boat to land a few moments before the vessel went down. My first care, upon setting foot on shore, was to thank the Almighty for my deliverance from the jaws of death, and give the homage of my gratitude to him to whom I was so evidently indebted for my preservation. End of section 97section ninety eight of loss of the sultana by chester d berry this librivox recording is in the public domain section ninety eight william h peacock i was born in tyler county virginia may twenty eighth eighteen forty five enlisted in the service of the united states at muncie indiana on the fifteenth day of december eighteen sixty three in the ninth regiment indiana cavalry was captured at sulphur trestle nine miles north of athens alabama on the nashville and decatur railroad september twenty fifth eighteen sixty four and confined in the cahaba prison alabama i was put on board the sultana with eighteen others of my company the boat was so crowded that there was not room for all of us on the second deck so five of us went up on the texas roof right in front of the pilot house i was the only one of the five that escaped the first recollection i had of the accident i was falling and had a cut on my shoulder bruise on my back and my right side and hip were scalded this happened seven miles above memphis i worked my way out from under the rubbish and helped get a good many of the boys out who were pinned down by it, until the fire got so hot that I had to stop and look out for myself. I saw boys start out to swim with all their clothes on, even their overcoats and shoes, but they did not go far before they sank. The only clothes I had on was a pair of drawers, a sack, a handkerchief, which one of the boys gave to me at Vicksburg before he died, and a hat that I picked up about a mile from the boat. I swam back to Memphis and was rescued by the gunboat boys and taken to Fort Pickens, seven and one-half miles below where the steamer's boiler exploded. I, with the rest, had just got out of prison and only weighed ninety-one pounds. At the time of my capture, I weighed one hundred and ninety-seven pounds and had not been sick a day. My present post office address is Cowan, Indiana. End of section 98 Section 99 of Loss of the Sultana by Chester D. Berry This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 99 W. G. Porter I was born in Fairfield, Lenawee County, Michigan, on the 19th of October, 1839, enlisted in the service of the United States at Adrian, Michigan, on the 2nd of August, 1862, in Company C of the 18th Michigan Infantry, was captured at Athens, Alabama, on the 24th of September, 1864, and confined in Cahaba, Alabama, or Castle Morgan, as it is sometimes called. The first night, April twenty fifth, 1865, on the boat, several of us slept on the boiler deck in a coal bin, as the other decks were so crowded. The next day we had a very pleasant ride. All were joyous and happy with the anticipation of seeing home and friends. The moment the boat touched the wharf at Memphis, Tennessee, the boys began to jump off. I went with the rest and roamed about town until ten o'clock in the evening of the 26th of April, when we went back to the boat, and as they were going to take on coal enough for the rest of the journey, we had to find new sleeping quarters. After roaming around on the cabin deck as best as I could among the sleepers, 
I found a place between the smokestacks, and spread down my blanket, and was about to lie down, when one of the men nearby said that he was holding that place for another man. I took up my blanket and found another vacant place large enough to lie down, but before I laid down was informed that it was being held for another man. I made my way back to the stairs and found room enough by sticking my feet over the steps, laid down, and was soon lost in sleep. I slept peacefully and quietly until awakened by the noise of the explosion. The first thought was that the hurricane deck had fallen in from being overloaded, but soon found out different. It was not long before it was all confusion, some singing, some praying, some lamenting, some swearing, some crying, and some did not seem to know anything. I soon made my way downstairs. In a short time everything available on the bow of the boat was thrown overboard. There were several bales of cotton and also some bales of hay, but there were generally enough men that went over with them to load them down. When the gangway board was shoved over into the water, there were a great many that went over with it. It was but a short time before the fire shot up and burned the boat to the water's edge. As the boat was crowded, the flames whipped down on them, and those nearest the fire could not stand it, and crowded back so that a great many near the edge of the boat were pushed overboard as the railing that went around the boat had been torn off. I remained on the boat until the largest part, or nearly all, had gotten off. I took off my clothing, placed it between two sticks, and tied them together with a pair of suspenders, with the intention of using them to aid me in floating or swimming, as I was not much of a swimmer. When I jumped off the boat into the water, I lost them. I do not know how it happened. The most that I was afraid of was that some drowning man would catch hold of me. While making for shore, I passed four men astride of something, using their hands for oars, and one of them gave the orders so that they would work together. When I got to land, or where the land is most of the time, I found that it was covered with water. The trees were quite dense, and out in the woods a few rods I found a large tree that was floating in the water, climbed upon it and called to some others that were trying to find a place to get out of the water. Some came and got on the log with me, and several got on another log nearby. I had to rub myself considerably to keep warm, as I did not have any clothing on. Remained there about four or five hours, when a boat came along and picked us up. When I got on to the boat, they gave me a sheet to wrap around me. When we arrived at Memphis, some of the Christian Commission came on board and distributed some clothing, shirts and drawers, to those that were needy. I was taken to the soldier's home, where in due time received a suit of clothes. Of the company to which I belonged, there were fifteen on board, and only three of them survived, William Thayer Fairfield, Michael Daly Palmyra, now deceased, and myself. There were fifteen on board belonging to Company K, and only three were lost. Other companies of the 18th Michigan Infantry lost heavily but I cannot give the numbers. My present occupation is farming. My post office, Weston, Michigan. End of section 99